Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're delighted that you could join us for what is the inaugural event in our Authors and in Insight series at the Hopkins Bloomberg Center. I thought it was just a talk between David and myself, but it turns out it's a series, and this is the inaugural event, so this is really an auspicious occasion. And given that this is a new series, and we're quite excited about landing this here at the, the Hopkins Bloomberg uh, Center, we couldn't think of a better inaugural author than David Leonard, who is here to speak to us about his latest book, Ours Was the Shining Future, The Story of the American Dream. Um, I note that David this summer sent me a uh, pre-publication copy. At that time, it was The Rise and Fall of the American Dream. It has since shifted to uh, the story of the American dream, which um, actually, I think, more accurately captures the notes of optimism that you have running through the book, so, um, so well understand why at the last minute you made that change. David practically needs no introduction, so I'm just going to do a, a brief one, a Pulitzer Prize winner, celebrated columnist in the New York Times, and one of the most incisive writers about economics and higher education working today. He's someone who takes principle seriously, but even more so is, uh, is someone who takes facts and data uh, very seriously. David's columns are must-reads for me, and I know that's true of many of my colleagues. Arts with a Shining Future is a welcome contribution, David, to your press of Bouvreau, and it is a perfect book for this venue in this moment. It is a sweeping, and at times, a dispiriting account of the arc of the American dream, which you define movingly as the ability of people to rise above the circumstances of your birth. Yet, as you say, this dream has been severely diminished in recent decades with stagnation replacing progress. It's a story that you tell with great rigor, specificity, and care, and these people think that you're fatalistic. There are bright spots on the horizon and a sense of optimism, as I said a moment ago, that courses through the argument about what is possible with the right combination of political vision and willpower. So, David, welcome to uh, our humble new home, and it's delightful <laughs> to have you here at, at Hopkins. Thank you. It's a thrill to be here. What a beautiful space. Congratulations on it. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's spectacular, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be talking with President Daniels about this subject because you and I got to know each other through some of the writing that I've done on economic diversity, which is very much connected to, I don't talk so much about economic diversity in, higher, in the lead higher education in this book, but it's a, a been a real theme of my writing. And Johns Hopkins has made such impressive progress on precisely that, becoming a more meritocratic place with many more students from all backgrounds that it's a pleasure to talk about these larger ideas with you. Thanks, David. I'm really excited to have this conversation. So look, why don't you do a little bit of scene setting? So this is a story about a fading, faltering um, American dream. When you think about the two or three indicia that sort of most dramatically capture the uh, challenges facing the realization of this dream today, what, 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 what comes to mind? What? So I'll pick three. Um, uh, the first is, is directly economic. Um, I describe in the book, uh, I'm not an economist, um, uh, but I spend a lot of time talking to economists and working with them. And there's a team of economists uh, at Harvard and Brown and a few other universities called Opportunity Insights that has done a lot of work that I'm sure you've heard about over the years, even if you don't recognize the name Opportunity Insights. And several years ago, they came out with a relatively technical measure of economic mobility, which is how people kind of move up the income ladder. And I said to them, you know, that's a really fascinating paper, but could you make it more simple? Could you just calculate what percentage of kids grow up to earn more money than their parents uh, at the same age? Which to me is actually sort of a basic measure of achieving the American dream. Um, not your relative place on a, on, a, on a ranking, but just do you have more money than your parents did? And I couldn't have done any of that research. But they went back and they dug through census data and IRS data, and they were able to do that research. And you may have even heard the statistics that they came up with because they become somewhat famous. 92% of children born in the United States in 1940 grew up to earn more money than their parents. 92%. It's a virtual guarantee. Think about how many people in that 92% in 1940 might have suffered a layoff at one point, or had a health crisis, or a divorce or were not straight white Protestant men during decades when the United States really had 
really much worse, even worse discrimination than we have today. And so achieving the American dream was nearly a guarantee, 92%. That percentage has since fallen to about 50% for younger people today. So that's be one measure. A second measure, just go ask Americans, how do you think the economy is doing? Doesn't really matter whether we have a Republican or Democratic president, whether the economy is growing or shrinking. It's been almost 20 years since most Americans said the economy was on the right track, the country was on the right track. Most people say the economy isn't working for them. So even if you don't believe the economic statistics, I would say let's trust people. And then finally, what's the most basic measure of, of the quality of life? I think it's life expectancy, how long people are living. In 1980, the United States had a typical life expectancy for a rich country, a little bit lower than some other rich countries, a little bit higher. For the last 15 years or so, the United States has had the lowest life expectancy of any rich country. It's the first chart in my book. It's not particularly close. We have a lower life expectancy than every country in Western Europe, lower than Canada, lower than Australia, lower than Japan and South Korea. We even have a lower life expectancy than some countries that aren't that rich, like China and Slovenia and Chile. And so to me, those would be the three things. Economics, uh, how do people feel, and how long are people living? So. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we are where we are, uh, where we're at, but maybe it'd be good for you to talk a little bit about, given that uh, that uh, set of findings around the decline of this idea of, of economic and social mobility. Um, if you were to basically map out again, without going into a, a luminous detail, but map out the major policy interventions that you think are available to us but have yet not been adopted, where would you start? Where do you see the sort of the, the most immediate priorities in terms of a very different policy configuration than the one we have today? I do think this is one area where we should have a little bit of optimism, in which I do think there is a reconsideration in a whole bunch of different ways of whether our economy is working for most people. I think you see it in some of President Biden's agenda. And, and I think you also see it, it's a little bit harder to, to notice, but I also really do think you see it in parts of the Republican Party. And so you can think about the, the metaphor of an economy as a pie is actually a useful one. And I think we can think both about what are some policies that would grow the pie, grow our GDP, GDP matters, and then what are also some policies that would cause it to be divided more evenly. And, and uh, the best thing would be if you have had a policy that would achieve both, but, but if you have a policy that achieves one without hurting the other, that's pretty good. I think we used to, as a country, be much more focused on the future than we are now. And so policies that can help grow the pie are policies that basically uh, are investments in the future. So the, the interstate highway system of the 1950s was a classic example of that. You compare that to today, in which we've invested so little in our transportation system, it takes longer today to go from New York to Los Angeles than it did 50 years ago. That is an incredibly damning indictment of our society. In 50 years, we have slowed down how long it takes to cross this country of ours. It, you'll sit in more traffic getting to the airport in New York. You'll spend much more time going through security at the airport in New York than you did 50 years ago. The scheduled flight time between New York and LA is a half hour longer than it used to be because technology has not worked in ways that speed up planes and the skies are more crowded. And then you'll land in LA and you'll have to spend more time in traffic on that end too. And it's not like we've hit some technological limit of how fast you can move around. In many other countries, life has sped up because they've invested more in infrastructure. I'm sure you have been to Shanghai. I've taken the eight-minute train from downtown Shanghai to the Shanghai airport. Eight minutes. Downtown Shanghai and the Shanghai airport are further apart than Times Square and LaGuardia Airport. I challenge any of you to get between those two <laughs> in eight minutes or 28 minutes, unless it's the middle of the night. And so whether it's investments like that, whether it's the share of our GDP that goes to R&D research, whether it's education, your great passion, um, I think all of those things can expand the pie and we just haven't been, been focused on them. If you're over 60 in America today, you're part of the most educated generation of any country in the world. If you're 40 and under, under you're not. If you're between 40 and 60, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. So, and then I think there are a set of things that are about how the pie is divided. And 
I'll be a little bit self-critical in my more than 20 years of being an economics writer, I don't think I've paid enough attention to the importance of labor unions. I think labor unions are vital, particularly for less educated people earning a good living. I've been in a union. I've been a manager of people in unions. I know unions are imperfect, but so are corporations. And if you have imperfect corporations not balanced by imperfect labor unions, you have a highly unequal economy. So those are a set of the policies that I would think about that could both lead us to have a bigger pie and a pie in which a small slice of affluent people aren't getting quite so much of that pie. So you know, when you think about you know, the, what this agenda looks like, um, which entails investment, but a, basically a pro-growth agenda, yes. um, which is actually, as I always say when I'm in a classroom with students before you can redistribute wealth, which I hope, you know, there's a strong instinct to want to do. Like I said, you got to create it first. Yes. So you're, you're thinking about both the creation and the redistribution. Um, you know, on the creation side, you know, much of what um, people like me, I will confess now, decades ago were arguing for were policies like trade liberalization, uh, deregulation of financial markets. Um, to think about more open, I'm a Canadian, I'm also an American now, but also more open immigration policy. And we could, as we did, we made the case and we truly believed that these were um, all interventions that would substantially increase the amount of economic wealth. So we, we believed that these were um, global welfare enhancing. But as we thought about these, we always acknowledged, at least in the work that I and my colleagues did back in Toronto, that um, there were going to be significant transition uh, costs. And indeed, there were going to be a significant number of people who would be adversely impacted by these changes. So to your point about distribution, we understood that there were prospective welfare gains on the table. But the question was, if we were going to realize them, how do we think about the people adversely affected by those changes? And there we would go and talk about the desirability of humane transition assistance and so forth, retraining assistance for people who lose their jobs, uh, for people who are concentrated in communities that are very dramatically impacted by declining industries and so forth, other types of housing assistance, transition assistance, mobility assistance, and so forth. The story, and you, know, you, you make reference to this in the book, is people like me made these arguments about how we could have our cake and eat it too. We, we got policies which were ostensibly welfare enhancing, but we just weren't so good about the, about the, about the distributive consequences of that and the need for transition assistance. So can you talk a little bit about why this neoliberal, you know, first of all, do you think that much of the kind of agenda, leave aside investment for the moment, public investment for the moment, but other parts of the agenda, which really were meant to be um, aimed at increasing uh, global wealth, um, whether those were misguided policies or the policies weren't so bad, we just, we just forgot about redistribution. You know, whether through these more narrowly sculpted policies for workers who have lost their jobs or a more progressive income tax system. And I, that's a very honest way to frame the issue. Um, and I don't, I, so I would first say I don't think the policies have worked out that well, right? If you think about, if you think about 60 plus percent of Americans don't have a four year college degree. And many of the divides we're talking about are between people with a four-year college degree and people without. There, there are other divides that are important. The 1% really are different than the 99. But, but there's a meaningful divide to talk about people with college degrees and people without. The, the deeply alarming life expectancy statistics that I mentioned before, that is overwhelmingly driven by stagnation in life expectancy for people who do not have a four-year college degree. Life expectancy for people who do have a do have a four-year college degree, people like me, um, still looks pre actually pretty good in this country. And so, I guess what I would say is we enacted this greatly liberalizing agenda on both trade and immigration, as you as you named. I find it really hard. I understand the theory of why that should have provided benefits for masses of Americans, right? Comparative advantage, all this stuff. But I find it really hard to think about the communities that are dominated by, by Americans who don't have a four-year college degree and think about tangible benefits that these policies have delivered to those communities. So yes, 
these policies have made a lot of goods cheaper. But that doesn't tend to be, these goods often are not the things that people define as being part of the good life. And some of these cheap goods, let's be honest, have had real downsides. That isn't the fault of trade. But a lot of it is technology that the more we look at it and we think, actually, a lot of the social media and the fact that everyone has these, these cheap phones in their pockets at all the time, I, that, that's not necessarily quality of life enhancing. And so I look back on these policies and I think, basically, America was sold liberalized trade policies by saying it will make our country richer and it will make the rest of the world freer. I think it is really hard to find good evidence for the idea that it has made less advantaged Americans, and I don't just mean the bottom, the bottom, I mean the kind of broad middle, better off. And it surely has not made the world freer than, than it used to be. Maybe the world would have been we, even less we, free. But we did lift, we did lift a lot of people out so, of poverty. So this is a, an argument that I've had with my 19-year-old, and he says to me, Dad, you're underselling just how much it has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And he's right about that. And I just did it again. So I will lay, maybe learn. Um, uh, that is an enormous accomplishment. It is an enormous accomplishment that hundreds of millions of people, predominantly but not exclusively in China, also in other parts of Asia, to a lesser extent in Latin America and Africa, but also have come out of poverty. That's not how those policies were sold to Americans, though. right? And I think it's really important to say if there is a backlash to these policies, it's fair to judge them on the terms on which they were sold. And they were sold as benefiting Americans as well as the rest of the world. And it's just a lot of the specific promises about trade have turned out to be false. I mean, Bill Clinton said, to chi said about China restricting the internet, good luck with that. It's like stapling jello to the wall. I don't know. I think the Chinese government has found a stapler that manages to keep jello on the wall for the most part, right? And so um, I don't think we should try to go back to a world in which everybody operates within their own country. But I do think that a lot of other countries have not liberalized their trade to the degree that the United States has. I think often they have kept industries protected, particularly industries that they consider sensitive, and they've allowed those industries to grow without being subject to global competition. That is part of the story of China's rise, that kind of, that kind of targeted protectionism. And so I think it's worth, and we haven't even talked about immigration, I think it's worth reflecting on the way in which this more market-oriented agenda has not worked for people. And sh could we have done it differently with taxes and with trade adjustment? Maybe we could have, but we didn't. And so I think it's fair in a small d democratic way that Americans are judging it based on what actually happened, not what could have happened. So when you set out uh, the policy matrix of the things that you would like to see to better instantiate a commitment to this progressive ideal and set of ideas associated with the American dream. The fact that we don't have these policies in the way that uh, you would uh, uh, ideally like raises to me sort of the sort of standard questions that you have um, um, when you think about, I know there's a better policy out there. I, I can argue for it. I have a principled foundation for it, and yet it's not adopted in, in public, in, in, in uh, domestic policy. So that then calls the question, um, and my mic, oh, there it's back. Um, that calls a question, was it actually this policy that I thought was unassailably better? Maybe it's actually got some defects, a set of de deficiencies that I somehow have overlooked that maybe makes the policy less tractable than I would have thought. Or then you go to the next stage and say, no, it's actually a really good policy, but it just meets really bad politics. It keeps, folks, keeps fading. Um, so it meets really bad politics, yeah. um, either as sort of vested interest that will weigh in against this policy because their ox will be gored, or it, um, it meets um, an intellectual climate, a cultural climate, which is, which is not um, amenable to the adoption of the policy. So good policy, bad politics, bad governmental structures, um, or maybe actually the policy wasn't so good. When you look at the story, and I think your story actually has pieces of all these elements, yeah. the arc of this narrative, which, which of the factors would you say are most important in undermining the effort to get 
a good policy matrix that would better um, manifest a commitment to this idea? I do think it's a mix of different things. I mean, I do think one of the questions as I've gone out on tour over the last couple of weeks that I often get is campaign finance reform. And, and it's not something I really discuss in the book. And I think, yeah. I do think a different campaign finance reform system, a different campaign finance system could make a, a real difference. I don't think something like that is a magic bullet. There probably is no magic bullet. We shouldn't pretend there is. I, I guess one of the things that I've come to think about is we talked a minute ago, I, I do think there's some signs of progress of both parties looking at what we had and reconsidering it. So I do think there's actually some political response here. I mean, Joe Biden and his administration, not just the left parts of it, but both the left and the center parts of it, talk about trade in different ways than previous administrations did. I mean, you look at Gina Raimondo, who's the Commerce Secretary, who's thought of sort of the most centrist member of this administration. She doesn't talk about trade the way members of the Clinton administration talk about trade. And I think that's a healthy thing to kind of acknowledge, wait a second, we pursued these things, they didn't work, let's revisit them. Having said that, even though I think there are signs of the political system reacting, I still think there's a fundamental problem in which the Republican Party in many ways is the party still of big business, at least in its policies, right? It fights for deregulation. It largely tries to eliminate labor unions. It fights for major reductions in taxes on affluent people. I mean, that's sort of the only major domestic legislation Donald Trump signed was a large tax reduction mostly for affluent people. The Democratic Party is more focused in economic policy on trying to put in place these things that lift the living standards of ordinary people. But the Democratic Party has alienated huge numbers of working class people with its policies on social and cultural issues. And not just its policies, but often its, its attitude. Michael Sandel, the philosopher, has listed all of the policies that Democratic Party officials have named as smart. right? Smart grid, smart this, smart power, smart that. And the kind of, the sort of implication, as Michael points out, is that if you don't agree with our policies, you're the opposite of smart, right? <laughs> and that's not really a great way to kind of win people over. And there's now a long list of issues in which the Democratic Party says, look, if you're not with us on this, it's because you're either ignorant or you are hateful. And immigration is a subject that I spend a lot of time on the book. Immigration is a really hard topic, right? But we used to have in this country a kind of progressive tradition of people on the left. Bernie Sanders embodied it, who said, you know what? I am worried that really high levels of immigration will be bad for vulnerable workers, immigrants and natives alike in this country. And now the Democratic Party really can't talk about any form of border security. Right? It's increasingly moving toward a world as, as long as someone sets foot in this country, they should be allowed to stay. And by the way, if you have a different view from us, it says something really dark about you. And I do not in any way want to underestimate the role that race and racism play in the appeal of the political right in this country over recent decades. It's been a very big role, and the Republican Party way too often engages in race baiting and worse. However, parts of the Democratic Party basically now argue anyone who's not with us, it's because of race or it's because of hatefulness toward other groups. And I think that's a really hard argument for the party to make when you consider the fact that over the last five years, Latino Americans, Asian Americans, and even by a few percentage points more, if you believe the latest polls, African Americans have moved away from the Democratic Party. And so I think at the same time that the Democratic Party claims to speak for the economic interests of working class people, it is alienating in a multiracial way many of the people for whom it claims to speak. And I think it should be much more self-reflective about why that is than it has been. So in your book, you talk about the role of ideas and in particular the role that the academy played in fueling a lot of the architecture of the new left and the extent to which it was the academy and the way in which those ideas were embraced by the new left that result in a democratic party that is not able to see as clearly the interests of the middle class. Can you talk a little bit more yeah. um, about the role that these ideas played and how it put the democratic party on a particular and 
um, you are you in the end problematic trajectory. Yes, thank you for asking that. So it's funny the way book tour works. There may, it's probably part of my own mind. There a set of the book is really a set of, of of historical stories, as you know, and so there are a set of the characters in the book who I found myself talking a lot about um, when I've gone out and talked about it. And actually, I'm about to talk about one who I haven't talked mo much about, which I'm looking forward to. Yes. So I've talked a lot about A. Philip Randolph, who's maybe my favorite character in the whole book. Um, uh, I've talked a fair amount about Grace Hopper, who's a computer scientist. But I want to talk now about C. Wright Mills, because he's, um, he's a great response to your question. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with C. Wright Mills. But um, he was this Columbia sociologist who kind of didn't fit in in the Ivy League. He was from Texas. He rode a motorcycle from the Hudson River Valley. He built his own houses. He was like a real radical and um, in multiple different ways. And he thought that the left's historical emphasis on the working class, the kind of Marxian working class, as the agent of change was really misplaced. And he actually had some very good evidence for this. I mean, the kind of old working class left in the 1950s had largely made excuses for stop the horrors of Stalinism. Um, and you were starting to see signs that the working class left was sort of more self-interested in union movements. Large parts of it refused to admit women. Um, and although unions had actually integrated a lot by the early 60s, certainly originally they, they were incredibly um, white nationalist unions were. And so Mills had a bunch of actually quite insightful critiques of the old left. But he argued in this, in this letter to the new left that was published in Britain was enormously influential in this country. It was the biggest influence on, on the formation of SDS. A personal note, I would not exist without SDS. My parents met through SDS activities. <laughs> um, uh, and so he argued, though, not just that the old left had kind of these terrible flaws, but that really the new agents of change in America were students, that that's where the energy was. If you looked at students demonstrating against nuclear weapons in Japan, if you looked at students standing up to the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, most famously, if you looked at students demonstrating against racism in the, United, in the American South, that students were really where the new left had to come from. It was profoundly influential. I mean, it really influenced so many of the movements that grew out of the 60s, the environmental movement, Ralph Nader's movement. And while I think it had a, made a lot of good critiques of the old left, I also think, ironically, for an intellectual movement, it had an arithmetic problem at the very core of it, which is in the 1960s, you couldn't have built a mass small d democratic movement just by appealing to intellectuals. There weren't enough intellectuals. You had to bring on Americans who didn't have a college degree as well. And to me, that's sort of the beginning of a lot of disdain. So it's not just criticizing the Vietnam War, but it's criticizing the soldiers who were going to fight in the Vietnam War as tools of oppression, right? Well, who was going to fight in the Vietnam War? It was the, the, the children of working class kids because many other people were getting student deferments. And I think there's a way in which it, it kind of reaches its peak with the 1972 campaign of George McGovern, who really, despite McGovern's own history uh, of this brave World War II soldier, really comes to embrace parts of the new left. He's the first person to argue for universal basic income. He doesn't use that phrase. It's so unpopular. Nixon just keeps bashing him with universal basic income in the campaign again and again. And I just think there were some real weaknesses of the idea of defining a movement that's supposed to be for the underdog by making it dominated by and catering to relatively privileged intellectuals. And there were alternatives out there. The German version of the new left was less elite. Bobby Kennedy in this country was both unapologetic about his support for civil rights and was also much more respectful of some of the social and cultural moderation of the American working class. And I, when I was reading this history of the 60s, I was just so struck at how much we have echoes of these same issues in our politics today. So, you know, for me, um, when you think about this question of um, why a party gets in the thrall of an idea that ultimately undermines their, their ability to build a mass base 
and to, and, and to again, um, more recently, um, seems to impair um, electoral success. Why isn't it open? What explains the fact that there isn't some political entrepreneur who says, wait a sec, there's a way here, and maybe this was a, you know, we, we've seen some instances where this seems to have worked, at least for a period of time, but why isn't there a way here on the part of the Democratic Party to see their roots, what they've been accomplished during FDR, to say, I think we can, we can actually um, pay homage to some of the agenda associated with the new left, but we can actually tether this to a meaningful um, array of policies that do good things for the middle class. What, what explains the failure for that individual to rise? Bobby Kennedy like and to be able to move the party. So first of all, I would point out that I think all three Democratic presidents um, of the modern era actually did get this. Joe Biden, Barack Obama, and Bill Clinton, all in different ways. Uh, someone recently said to me, and I'm, I wish I were remembering who it was, whatever you want to say about Joe Biden, no one thinks he looks down on you, right? You can call him old. <laughs> you can call him you know, too left. You can call him all these things. But Joe Biden doesn't really look down on people. Now, I know that people accused Obama of being a hoity-toity law professor who looked down on people. But actually, Obama won a larger share of the working class vote than either the Democratic nominee before or after him, John Kerry or Hillary Clinton. Um, he, he tended to talk a lot in ways that were very respectful of, of different people in different ideas. Go back and watch Obama's 2004 speech, the one that made him famous, and look how patriotic it is. It's so deeply patriotic. It glories in the American idea while also saying, hey, we've had a lot of problems. And Bill Clinton obviously did a whole bunch of this stuff. And so uh, that doesn't, if anything, that makes your question all the starker. Because it's like, wait a second. The only people to have been elected president from the Democratic Party are people who, you know, Barack Obama out. talked in depth about the importance of border security. Right. In depth. Barack Obama, in his 2008 acceptance speech, talked about the idea of how if undocumented immigrants, although he, that's not the phrase he used, he used a phrase no Democrat would use anymore, if undocumented immigrants came into this country and competed for work with Americans, that undermined common prosperity. I mean, that is the old tradition of people on the left saying, hey, you know what? There's a reason CEOs want unlimited immigration. Um, uh, but it makes your question actually all the sharper, which is if this has been the, the successful examples in the party, why doesn't it struggle to do more of it? And look, I think we know that often um, uh, there are internal dynamics to institutions in which people sometimes struggle to break out of those internal dynamics. I mean, to take another example, why isn't Joe Biden bragging about the fact that he just opened up Alaska to more oil drilling? That's a phenomenally popular policy because it can help lo lower gas prices. Why isn't Biden out there saying, I've been both the most climate friendly president there is, and also I want to bring your gas prices down because so I went out and approved this. Instead, he's saying, oh, I had to approve that Alaska thing my lawyers told me I needed to. And I think it's because he's listening too much to internal forces rather than external forces, but I can't see inside his head. How seriously do you take the next stage of the evolution of the Democratic Party and its policy uh, priorities. Um, how seriously do you take the role of um, identitarian politics, these sort of cultural, social cultural issues that again, um, clearly uh, alienated a lot of, um, of uh, parts of our country as again, another uh, part of the story of how the ideas of the new left have morphed in a way that again, have impaired this ability to build the kind of coalition that you see as more enduring and more effective in terms of being able to advocate for this, for these policies. I think two things are simultaneously true. We live in a country with, with terrible discrimination, particularly terrible racism, particularly racism against African Americans. Um, and I actually think it's important to separate that out as a, as a distinct kind of American racism uh, that is different from discrimination against other groups, although there is also discrimination against other groups. Um, uh, we live in a country with terrible racial inequities and, and reducing those racial inequities and aspiring to a society where they don't exist 
is one of the most important things we can do as Americans. That's fact one. Fact two is the kind of identitarianism that is very popular on college campuses and in parts of the media um, is not popular with most Americans and I think is often counterproductive to reducing those same inequities that I just described in the first thing. Now, that doesn't mean we should never talk about race, but if you look at kind of much of the language that the left uses today, it's constantly dividing people into groups at every possible moment rather than talking about the things that Americans have in common. And one of the reasons that I think A. Philip Randolph is such a heroic figure is A. Philip Randolph is remembered as a civil rights hero as he should be. He got his start as a labor union leader organizing black workers in the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. It's a bad name because they also represented maids who were, so it could be the Brotherhood and Sisterhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids, but that's not what it was called. Um, and the reason he was so important was he helped break open the union movement so it was a movement that could include both white and black people. And here's what's really interesting. The white-black pay gap and the white-black life expectancy gap in this country De decline really markedly in the 40s and 50s, even before the great victories of the civil rights movement. And so it is possible, indeed it's necessary, in order to make progress toward our racial inequities, to make progress toward our economic inequities. And it's often possible do, to do that by bringing people together rather than splitting them apart. And finally, it's not just white people <laughs> who find the identity politics to be off-putting. I think we would all agree that this kind of notion of whatever phrase you like, identity politics, has become much, a much bigger part of our political discussion over the last five years than it was before that. As I just mentioned, the last five years are also five years in which we have seen notable movement of voters of color away from the Democratic Party. I didn't predict that. I didn't expect it. I find much of it confusing. But it's really hard to argue that this kind of hyper-focus on identity is helping to create a larger multiracial coalition for the political left in the United States. So, um, you know, going back to what you uh, uh, mentioned a few moments ago, you know, we do have a moment with this administration that, um, in fact, a lot of the ideas that, that percolate through your book in terms of a more progressive policy environment, and particularly on the investment side, when we think about the uh, uh, success of this administration in securing significant, significant, unprecedented levels of government, uh, uh, unprecedented levels of investment in the recent, as against the recent past, in terms of infrastructure, uh, uh, a very um, different approach to economic development that turns on a revival of industrial policy ideas that certainly, um, at you know, 20 years ago would have been really discredited as, as something that is inimical to uh, sound uh, economic development policies. So, so we, see a, we see an amalgam of policies that really seem to capture yes. the um, idea and the agenda that you feel has been neglected, and yet, and yet, we know, again, from the recent polls, how challenging this is for this president. So again, now we've got a situation of, on, um, on uh, your uh, framework, good policies actually adopted, maybe, maybe actually the way in which they've been adopted you might take, have some reservation with, so I'm putting that. Good policies yeah. actually enacted seem to be um, having effect in terms of changing behavior, creating opportunities within the country, and yet we've got a, a president who is mightily challenged in terms of his uh, popularity. Yes. So how do we put this together? That is a hard question, and I'm not gonna pretend that I have a pat answer to that question. So I would say a few things. One, look, it's really hard to talk about Donald Trump for a whole variety of reasons, right? He's got his rhetoric, which doesn't always match his policies. Um, he says a lot of truly hateful things about all kinds of groups of Americans. He rejects basic notions of democracy that presidents of both parties 
uh, have embraced before. And so I want to be really careful here that I'm not coming off as you know saying that guy has a whole bunch of good ideas. That you know, uh, he's a uniquely problematic figure for American democracy. <laughs> Donald Trump is the one who, in these polls that look bad for Joe Biden, who is beating him. And and it is clear that it, by both his rhetoric and some of his policies, and very much his his image in the public mind. He also represents a rejection of these decades of the old consensus, right? Donald Trump is the one who really pivoted the United States in his own chaotic way toward a, a less, less belief in trade, right? Yeah. Toward, toward, so I don't think that it is a political rejection of the, uh, I think both parties are starting to grapple with the notion, hey, you know what, this long experiment we had in a more rough and tumble version of capitalism has left many people unhappy, right? Donald Trump, Matt Iglesias, the Substack writer, has pointed this out, really did run to the left of the Republican Party on economic matters, right? right? Social Security, Medicare, trade. So I think that's important to say, in some ways, you could almost hold some of these ideas constant between Biden and Trump. That still isn't really an answer to your question. Joe Biden has put in place a whole bunch of economic policies that it feels like they have a lot of logic and history and even early evidence on their side. And yet, the guy's really struggling. I, I don't have a complete answer. The things I would say are inflation, which is mostly not Biden's fault, but he certainly has failed to solve, is uniquely corrosive to the public mood. Uh, and real wages really have fallen for Americans over the last couple of years. So I'm not that shocked that they're really unhappy about it. Um, and look, I don't know exactly how to think about the age thing, but one of the things I argue in the book is public opinion deserves some deference. Americans keep telling us in poll after poll that they're not that happy about Joe Biden's age. I think that probably plays some role in this, and it's not just his numerical age. I don't, I've, I've spent a little time with him. I don't have, I, I think he's totally with it. He also just looks old, right? You see him on TV. And so I think people are to some extent reacting to, to that. But I, I really don't pretend that I have a full answer. I also think it's entirely possible that Joe Biden will win re-election. So I've got a few questions that have come in. Uh, two are um, more around uh, clarification or definition. The first one is, how would you define working class in the US today? So there is no perfect definition, but I find I'm comfortable with the idea of not having a four-year college degree as a, as a first order definition. And that puts uh, working class Americans as you know, roughly around 60 plus percent of adults. Um, cause and effect. Aren't people with four year degrees likely to have come from wealthier families? Yes, they are. So, but, uh, so clearly four year degrees are not the whole effect. But let me describe, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on the stage with the university president. Let me describe my favorite study uh, that tries to get at the actual causal effect of college. So this is a study done in Florida. In Florida, there is a cutoff in order to get into any four-year college in the Florida state system. I believe at the time, the least selective one was Florida International University. If I'm getting that wrong, I apologize. But, I, but I've written about this, so you can Google it. And so if you got a certain SAT score, you just got into Florida International University. If you got 10, per, 10 points below it, you didn't get into any four-year college. And it meant you really didn't go to a four-year college. Now, let's be honest, the, 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 the kid who gets an 850, if that was the cutoff on the SAT, is functionally equivalent to the kid who gets an 840. There's some noise there. But the 850 kid got in and the 840 did. And so a group of economists used this to study what is the effect of going to a four-year school. Because these, these groups are basically identical on either side of the line, but one of them got into a four-year school and many of them went, whereas the ones just below it didn't get into any four-year school. Sure enough, 10 years later, the ones who just got in, much more likely to go to a four-year college, much more likely to graduate, also doing better by almost any measure. Earning more money, just generally better off. And so, that's not the only study that shows this, but to me it's one that those of us who aren't economists can understand. And um, there's all kinds of evidence that there really is a causal benefit of, of going to college and finishing it. You can think of it like the first obstacle course of adulthood. 
It's not just what you're learning in the classes. You're learning to navigate society. You succeed, and it gives you confidence that you can go navigate other things. And so I am not claiming that all these divides between four-year college graduates and non-graduates are causal. They're not. But I really do think there's an important causal role in many of these things. And then the final thing I'd say is, if you talk to almost anyone who has the resources to comfortably send their children to college, they really make sure their children go to college. And so I think Turns revealed out. preferences say something important. I don't think everyone should go to college. I think we need to develop good jobs that provide good living for people who don't want to go to a four-year college. I think every American should have the opportunity to go to a four-year college. Certainly, every privileged American child has the opportunity to go to a four-year college, and the vast majority of them do so. Next question. Pessimists are often proven right or pleasantly surprised. Over the next few decades, what evidence should those of us hoping to be pleasantly surprised look for that you feel would suggest that the American dream and our democracy will remain vibrant? So this is part of why I changed the subtitle um, from the rise and fall to the story of the American dream. I didn't want to suggest that story was over. I don't believe it is. I think the biggest reason for optimism about our society is actually how well our political system has worked to change our society in recent years. And I know many people will find that surprising, and they think our political system is rigged, and they think there's no hope of changing it. But I think the evidence is actually voluminous to the contrary. So what is it that helped create the mass prosperity of the 40s, 50s, and 60s? I've already mentioned it was the labor movement. The labor movement came together as a huge underdog. It wasn't just A. Philip Randolph who was an underdog. It was the whole labor movement. They'd lost every fight they fought in the 19-teens and 20s. And then they basically organized a huge movement, and they got the government on their side through the FDR administration, and ultimately through Republican administrations. And they built this mass prosperity in the United States. Think about how much the civil rights movement and the women's movement of the 60s, think about how much the disability rights movement of the 70s changed this country, often against really long odds. More recently, how many of us would have predicted we would have marriage equality in this country um, as rapidly as we had it? That was a grassroots political movement that developed a goal and moved public opinion and elected friendly politicians and changed the law. And by the way, another thing that the gay rights movement has been is extremely savvy and respectful of socially moderate opinion in this country. How do they argue for gay rights? Through two things. One, marriage, a deeply small c conservative institution, and two, the military, right? It was the, the arguments they made were deliberately designed to appeal to people who weren't yet persuaded, as opposed to make people feel good who were already persuaded. All of those examples I've just given you are on the political left. But there are also examples on the political right. Whatever you think of the anti-abortion movement, it didn't respond to its biggest defeat 50 years ago by saying the system is rigged, we're giving up. It organized. It effectively took over the Republican Party. It won local elections. It then won presidential elections and made sure people who agreed with it were put on the Supreme Court. And it ultimately reversed Roe v. Wade, which I think most of us thought would, was never going to happen. I look at this history, as well as the success of some smaller movements, like the marijuana legalization movement, like the minimum wage fight for 15, like the movement to expand Medicaid in red states, like the surprisingly successful movement to keep Donald Trump from repealing Obamacare. I look at all this and I say grassroots political movements in this country really can work. They often take decades to work, but they can change our society in profound ways. And I think the problem is that we actually haven't, for the most part, had grassroots movement in this country that were devoted to lifting the living standards of most working class and middle class people in this country. I think if we did have movements like that, and they did move public opinion, and they did elect friendly, pol friendly politicians, I really think they could succeed. And I really think that for all of our problems, the American system still has the power to fix some of the very problems that it has created. You know, one of the things as you're talking, David, I, I, you know, I notice a sort of a, a through line uh, in the course of your book between, on one hand, being somewhat quixotic about these big bang moments uh, you know, during the during the FDR days, and just the you know keep the capacity 
of the country at that time to fundamentally alter the architecture of its uh, institutions and its policies. And as you're talking now um, and thinking about where this mass movement can take us, I'm not quite sure whether it is that you're um, hoping for just a series of sustained policy changes done incrementally, thoughtfully, over a period of decades, or you're hoping for another Big Bang moment. Um, how, how, what is a scale of change, ideally, that you would like to see to give proper expression to the analysis and to the dream of the restoration of the progressive ideal in the way that you would like? There is a, there is a school of thought that basically you don't get this kind of change without a truly terrible crisis, right? a war, a depression. Um, but I, I don't think those are necessary to do it. And I, there's a really good book that I recommend called The Great Exception by a historian named Jefferson Cowie. I quote it in the book. And he argues that pe progressives in particular have spent too long focusing on the New Deal. And we're just not going to get the New Deal again. I mean, the things that you needed for the New Deal to happen, you needed this bizarre alliance between Southern segregationists and Northern liberals. You needed a depression that started so early in one president's term, and he was so bad at addressing that it continued for more than three years while Hoover was in office. I mean, it was, it was from the 1929 crash to Roosevelt taking office was like three and a half years, and the collapse of Lehman to Obama taking office was like three and a half months. <laughs> right? And those create very different political circumstances. And what Cowie argues is we're not going back to that that kind of crisis. And we probably shouldn't hope for it anyways, because it you know, could be really, really horrible. However, I really do think that it is possible to achieve change even without such crises. It's not going to be as big. It's not going to be a big bang change like the New Deal. But I still think it's possible. And you know, Benjamin Friedman, a, an economic historian, has written this book called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth, in which he argues that actually the New Deal is the exception, and most great progress comes in better times than worse times. And I, I don't know exactly how to think about that mix. I would just say I don't think giving up or waiting for some moment that may never arrive is really an option that we can take. I think these problems are significantly serious that we should basically be doing anything we can to address them. Maybe some of it will be small, incremental things uh, during good times. Maybe there'll be a bunch of policy ideas that are on the shelf for when a crisis comes. Um, but we should be working on these ideas because, I mean, just think about that. Whatever you think the causes are, think about that life expectancy statistic that I mentioned and try to think about, boy, what can we do so we are no longer the grim outlier among rich countries. And as you think about that agenda, to what extent um, do you think about serious institutional reform as part of the story here? You mentioned campaign finance reform a few moments ago. But you know, again, to the extent that we want to get a better politics and more desirable policy outcomes, it, to what extent do we have to actually get at perhaps some of the dreary but really important work about thinking about changes to, uh, to campaign finance to, as you know, as it started off um, at the early part of the Biden uh, presidency, thinking about changes to the composition of the Supreme Court. You know, just there's a, there's a, there's a host of changes one could think about that might conduce to a better likelihood, higher likelihood of getting the kind of policies that you're talking about being adopted. Yeah, I think they're important. I mean, we're in, the, we're in the longest stretch of kind of government stagnation in this country that we've ever been in. We're in the longest stretch without any new states. By the way, we're sitting in a city that, where people are not able to, right. to vote for Congress. And it's a city that's, that, that historically has been overwhelmingly black and is still disproportionately black. And that feels like um, pretty anti-democratic. Uh, not, not doing much with constitutional amendment. No, we haven't had a constitutional amendment in a very long time. Um, uh, so these are things that those are not the constitutional amendments in new states are not un-American. They're American, right? And and thinking about how to change our structure of government in in different ways. I would. So I think those are really important to think about. I think they are also though an example of it's important to be rigorous in how you think about policy. 
the voting rights bill that, that the Biden administration and Democrats put forward never had a chance of passing. It was obvious from the beginning they didn't have the votes. They didn't really have a theory of why they were offering it, even though they didn't have the votes. And it had a bunch of things that experts said actually may not be that important. And that instead sort of, it had some things that are very important. But I, I think the same way that I mentioned that the gay rights movement was, was so impressively rigorous and even ruthless about what we care about is getting here, let's figure out how we can actually get there, I think it's important for voting rights movement and the constitutional movement to be similarly rigorous. And you know, for example, should the big fight really be over whether voter ID is the worst thing in the world? Maybe it should, but there are a lot of democracies around the world, in fact most, where they basically require voter ID. So is the answer to have a huge fight over voter ID, or is the answer to get all Americans across classes and other groups IDs that they can use? I don't know, but it, clearly the answer can't be, let's put a bill up that's never going to pass, um, and, and then think that we've actually done something important. So I'm getting the signal uh, that um, the formal part of our program is at an end, say, for one last question, which in some sense goes back to where we uh, started earlier uh, this afternoon before we were to came into this session. David said, look, if there's questions on the New York Times, on media, I'll field them. And I said, I'm really hoping that we don't go there too quickly. I'd like to be able to have a discussion around the book uh, that you've been working on. But you know, now having said that, <laughs> I do think it's, it's an important part of the story. And uh, again, without um, taking much time from the bar and book sales, um, say something about the role of media in, 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 in our current moment in terms of either fostering or undermining the prospects of a more hopeful progressive policy matrix? I mean, look, we, so we, there are a lot of challenges with today's media and there are a lot of problems that I think we should be, reflect on. Um, I, I think from a kind of business perspective, elite national media is actually in really good shape. I don't mean that the New York Times' future is guaranteed. I mean that if we do our jobs badly over the next 30 years, someone else is gonna replace us as a publication that huge numbers of people are willing to pay for across the country. The business model is proven for the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker. That stuff is all fine. And that wasn't a given, right? With that said, though, we really do have a whole bunch of problems with our media landscape. One. I think those of us who work at publications, like I just said, are part of the issue of, of kind of Americans who are more comfortable becoming more distant from Americans who are less comfortable. And I think we should reflect on whether we're baking into our coverage certain assumptions uh, of a relatively comfortable, affluent, progressive American elite. Many of the things that I said about the kind of C. Wright Mill stuff, I think should be reasons for reflections of us, of us in media. The second thing I would say, and I don't have any good solution for this, there's a huge media ecosystem on the right, which I don't think is inherently problematic. The idea of having partisan media or ideological media is the norm in much of the world. It was the norm for much of American history. I do think it's a problem that Fox News and some of its other places spread stories that are not true. <laughs> like the COVID vaccines don't work, Barack Obama wasn't born in America. And there's empirical research that documents it's not simply a question of conservative values. People who watch these shows end up believing things that are just not true, right? Like, I hope I've made clear I'm very open to conservative arguments on many subjects. If they want to talk about why abortion is bad or they want to talk about why taxes should be low, go ahead. But when they're spreading stuff that is just false, that's a huge problem. And then finally, I would say, Local media is a huge problem for the state of our democracy and distrust. Local media does not have a business model that works. It is vital if we don't have people keeping accountability on school boards, if we don't have people covering what's going on in Baltimore, which is a great example of a city that's been left behind in many ways by this new era. It's really bad for American democracy. And local politics and media is actually an area where we can dial down some of the political temperature on these things, even if it doesn't always seem like it. Uh, Americans are naturally gonna sort on a whole bunch of national issues. But on whether a road should be built somewhere, 
they might have intense fights about it, but people who disagree about abortion and tax rights might actually be on the same side. And it's not the worst thing to realize, oh, I disagree with that person. He or she's not evil. And so to the extent that any of you are thinking about how to apply some of your own time or brain power or, or money, I would encourage you to think a lot about local media. We're fine. Uh, I'm deeply worried about local media. Well, just on that note, before we conclude, there is a really interesting experiment that's underway for those of you who are in Baltimore. But there's a really interesting experiment with the Baltimore banner, yes. um, which is an online, uh, not no 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 newsprint, but online um, uh, startup that's seeking to provide serious coverage of local state news, which. Um, the Baltimore Sun, the, uh, the incumbent, has steadily over the years provided less and less coverage to. So it's an interesting experiment as to whether they'll be able to make it work. And it's on a combination of philanthropic investment and also uh, subscriber fees. So I just realized watching. I can't believe I didn't, in a couple of other of my book talks around Washington, uh, I live in Bethesda. And in a couple of other of my book talks, I've said part of the problem with the Democratic Party is it's become more Bethesda and less Baltimore. How did I forget to say that so far yet today? <laughs> what a terrific note to end on. Thank you all for being here. David, that was great.